Hello everyone and welcome to a new edition of Game Tales, that show where we talk for around an hour or two, sometimes it happens, about things that we find to be interesting for us, personally. And today's theme is that of tabletop games, and again I am joined by Steven, which uh, some people have suggested I call you, call you Stefan, because it's, you know, your proper name. Uh, yeah, that, that that works, but um, since I do believe that uh, most of our listeners are from um, English-speaking countries, or at least, you know, the, this is our commonality, we uh, all speak English, I'm, I'm fine with Steven, it's okay. Actually, uh, I'm kind of lucky, living in Denmark, they have the name, but it's Stefan, so around, it's close. Uh, yeah, around these parts I go by Stefan. And um, he's I'm, from the channel See Nonsense. Yes, yes, I am. How is uh, how are you doing? Fine, fine. I am currently in the process of getting a fourth a job. The f- uh, is, is are you just done with sleeping? You just don't, don't want to do it anymore. You just keep getting jobs. Sleeping is fun, man. Well, dude, I've been <laughs> I've been looking for I've been looking for something for like uh, two years. Haven't really found a lot. So uh, it's uh, it's it's a good problem to have, I think. Do you want to have some of mine? Because I don't think I can keep all of them with four jobs. You do you do need to get some sleep, man? Yeah, one day, who knows? Maybe when I'm retired or dead, both, probably. I think I think re- retirement and death for you will coincide. To be honest. Yeah. Hashtag cynicism, but also reality. Well, the current fourth job is so that I can get a pension because it's like an actual job job. Oh, it's one of them. Uh, it's one of them super duper official yeah. things. Okay, they're even making me sign paperwork. I suppose I just started talking, so it's not yet official. But yeah, the, it may be. the simple fact that some people actually think they're gonna have pensions uh, at any time in the following twenty years in Romania is just laughable to me. But that's yeah, a different. I mean, that's a more. We're gonna have a zombie plague by then. Maybe Thanos will show up. Who knows? And those things will actually be better than the current leadership. Yeah, it will. <laughs> anyway, let's. Uh, oh, can we before before we begin? I'd like to uh, give a super special shout out to. Uh, I don't know how the name is pronounced. I think it's Rainick one one three three who commented on our last episode and told me the name of the NES game I was describing. And it's actually called Kickmaster, the game. So thank you very much, Rainik1133. I actually, I, I replied to uh, to his comment as well. Uh, I'm definitely, I need, I need to, I need that, I need that back in my life somehow. I need to, I need to get an emulator going, which by the way, Nintendo has been, Cracking down on uh, sites um, housing uh, ROMs of their games. Yeah, especially so. ones that let you play them through the website. Yeah. The, the degree to which it cracked down on those is like like the Hulk trying to squash a mosquito and blowing up half the planet. Which isn't out uh, uh, isn't outside the purview of what and how Nintendo usually does these things. I'm actually afraid now too. I want so I have this idea to uh, st- I've mentioned it to start my own podcast, uh, but it's gonna be about other geeky stuff, not necessarily games. It's gonna, mostly gonna be about TV shows and movies I watch. But my idea is to actually play games whilst doing it, and I wanna talk about the first season of Castlevania on Netflix and play Castlevania doing it. And I'm kind of afraid to do that now because I don't know if the gameplay will be flagged or not. Castlevania is a Konami game, so it's not owned by Nintendo. So I think you may be safe on that. Oh, aspect. okay, okay. No, I thought I thought they they just flag anything that was released on the NES at oh, any no, no, time. Oh, no, no. they okay. they sort of sued that that uh, pair of sites for more money than I think our country makes in a, in a year. Um, I think mostly because they lost the revenue from uh, my news shows because I started replacing gameplay from Nintendo games when I talk about them with the uh, paint drawings. I think that's the reason. Cool. Sure. Good work. Yeah. Okay. So that that would be nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna do so, that. If I tabletop, if, tabletop games. Yes. Yeah. Tabletop games. Let's Sorry talk about, about them. Sorry about that, uh, listeners. But usually, like I've been saying this to Yunagam, we might. If he'd have the time, because apparently he doesn't have the way he's swamped in jobs, we 
it would be cool to have like a separate podcast where we just talk about news and shit. Yeah. Uh, but that's not gonna happen. So fuck it. We're, we're just gonna stick it into this one. Yeah. Um, tabletop games. I uh, it's something that I actually talk about a bit more than you guys on Gaming HD. Mm-hmm. I actually I have several videos. I actually uh, one of the few if not the only ge- uh, video that talks about tabletop games on Gaming HD is a guest uh, video of mine. It's called The Influence of Tabletop Games on Video Game Design. Which you should go watch after this video. Yeah, or just now, it's fine. Okay, so we'll there's, wait. So there's that. And I have another one up on my channel called uh, Top 7 Differences Between Tabletop and Video Games. And I have a couple of... Uh, RPG system, tabletop RPG system reviews as well. So I tend to I tend to dip my foot more into the tabletop realm than you guys do. So, uh, uh, but I'm I, I know you played uh, tabletop games at a certain point, even though you can't play them now because hey, you have four jobs. Yeah, I used to play them with the tabletop simulator more recently, and back in the olden days. We used to have tabletop games in Romania, like in the olden, olden days. Did you ever have that game with the Dacians and the Romans? I didn't, but a neighbor friend of mine did, and uh, yeah, that was like was, I don't even know. I don't. I don't even know how to categorize that game. It was. It was a bit of a sort of miniature war game in a way. Uh, it was a bit. basically. It was kind of like it, it was a it, it was a dumbed down version of checkers. Basically, because you didn't even have to go diagonally or anything. Yeah, if you played by the standard rules, rules yes. But I had actually no idea what the rules were back then. So oh, we yeah. just you just made shit fought up. with them. Yeah, yeah, that's really. what we did. That's good. Yeah, but uh, just as a general um, contextualizing, tabletop games uh, encompass a lot of things. It basically encompass encompasses everything you can play on a physical, literal tabletop. Things uh, from, uh, like I said earlier, checkers, chess, go, uh, to card games, and uh, more recently to board games, um, and uh, obviously uh, anything that is... Um, RPG system related, D and D, Pathfinder, what what have Shadowrun, whatever what, whatever is your poison. So when we talk about tabletop games, we're talking generally about this the, the entire the the, the entire uh, category, and uh, it, it has a lot of it has a lot of uh, uh, subgenres. So what were some of the tabletop games you played when you were a kid? When I was a kid, uh, I was uh, I was quite big into chess. I enjoyed I enjoyed playing chess, which I think it kind of makes sense considering my uh, my penchant for playing uh, turn based games. Now, um, I wasn't I, I could never get into backgammon. Uh, I loved Monopoly, although for one pause here for those who don't know, backgammon is sort of like the national pastime of Romania. Everybody plays it nonstop. Yeah, so I never, I never really got into that. Uh, I really enjoyed Monopoly, not because, well, now looking back at it, looking at it, it's a pretty shitty game. But back then, it was a, it was a symbol. More, it was more of a symbol of this is thing. This is a a game that kids in uh, in the movies play, and now we have access to it. You so actually it, had like actual Monopoly. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. An you, you, had the, you had the Romanian version. No, not the, privatization. Not not necessarily a Romanian version. It said Monopoly on it, but it was a. Oh. It wasn't a. It was a low grade Naka fish sort of uh, sort of a, a variety of it. Around the neighborhood, we had a, a local Romanian version of Monopoly called privatization. It was. We also don't know. Uh, most of the industry, most of the businesses in Romania used to be owned by the state because we were a communist country. That's what and, happens, yeah. Yeah, in the 90s, it, that, stuff, that fizzled and things were being privatized, were being sold to different individuals with the hopes that they would continue to run those companies and turn a profit and hire people and, you know, do good. Uh, that didn't happen. They mostly left things to rot and sold them off bit by bit. 
Yeah, Wait, little little did balls. they know. Little did they know, capitalism doesn't work like that. Well, they they are still very very rich. Like the people that just sold oh, yeah, sold yeah, yeah. factories for nothing. Yeah, I'm just still I'm made just, a bundle. I'm, I'm just talking about the the, no, the, the state. Uh, yeah, the state had uh, completely different uh, ideas of what or how well, capitalism well, is supposed to work. To, to be fair, some of the people that bought them were in the state at then and knew exactly what they were doing. Oh yeah, we've been money. Uh, uh, we've been uh, a corrupt country since before being a country. I think. Yeah, that corruption sort of uh, it's sort of ingrained. It's it's pretty, it's, it's the pastime. Like pretty back much. Uh, so uh, that that the traditional monopoly was uh, was not about corruption. It was just monopoly, but called privatization, and it had more Romanian-sounding names for the places. But the basic rule set was the same. No, oh, cool, cool. I I don't know why. I'm, I'm not sure. I've actually. Uh, seen or heard about that we had a bunch of, a bunch of we had a couple of board games growing up but they were simplistic to say the least we had things like uh, there was a football game that you play with some uh, tokens you had to uh, push one of the tokens with the other by uh, sort of squeezing them a bit so they would you'd hit the ball like token to get into your opponent's uh, gate I think well, I, I think I remember something of that sort. Yeah, they also had one um, that translated word by word would be "Don't get upset, brother," but I think it's called "Sorry" in English. I remember playing it. That's, I cannot remember anything about it. Yeah, that was a that was a thing. There was, that that was one of the one of the board game type things we had. And there was one that I remember playing it like quite a lot. It was a, a variation of shoots and ladders. It was on a, like a thick cardboard, uh, glossy cardboard type that you could fold into. And it uh, it didn't have any shoots and others in it, but it was the same kind of concept. You would roll a dice and you would go on a path that would wind around itself and eventually get to the end goal. And across uh, each path, you would find certain of uh, uh, hindrances in your path or advantages. It was a very nice game that I really liked and I actually made a sequel to. I drew okay. it. I liked it. No one played it much. Let's have uh, it's good that you have uh, goals and hobbies that uh, that that turn into something more credible. Mm-hmm. But uh, the uh, the the you know like tabletop games the way we have them now it's it's something almost extraordinary. I mean, the, they've evolved at the rate that this be it just boggles the mind. Like ex- I could have not imagined exactly. playing these kind of games back then. No, it, it's just. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, tabletop games uh, developed on their were well, not necessarily on their own because they kind of took some uh, some ideas from video games. Which granted, all the video games took all of their ideas from tabletop games and then added their own spin on them. But tabletop games uh, actually, I think, developed and evolved much faster than video games did. Uh, I think I think they've reached a level of complexity. But also ease of uh, ease of use. You know, I mean, it's not uh, well, there's, technical there's... ease of use. Some of them still have manuals so deep that you'll get lost in them, like the uh, the adaptation for Dark Souls. <laughs> well, I, sure, we still but... don't know how to play it. We yeah. we've played it, but still have no idea how to do it. Sure, but that's a that's a very that's a very niche sort of product. I'm talking I'm talking more about because um, the the Dark Souls game will appeal mainly to the Dark Souls players. Yeah, people that were in it because it was obtuse and you yes, had no idea what exactly, to do. Exactly, but I'm talking about the 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 other uh, popular titles and the the things that spurred on this evolution. Kind of things like uh, Settlers of Catan or oh, uh, Carcassonne, yeah. which, uh, granted, not they don't have extremely complex they don't have complex rules, but they and they're re- easy to pick up and quite fun to play and great to play with others uh, cooperatively well not not those particular titles but anyway that's the idea and i uh, i saw this as a bit more of a the tabletop uh, designers taking or mostly all of the best things they they saw in terms of how video games are designed and worked and marketed and actually doing it way better and at a much higher price point, to be honest. Oh, yeah, they tend to be quite expensive, especially if you factor in uh, things like 
Well, the the the, the games that are based on uh, owning a lot of rule books, like your battle decks, your uh, Warhammer. So you need hundreds and do- hundreds Those? and hundreds of dollars worth of books just to be able to play the game. Yeah, that's a, a that's the realm of the of the RPG system uh, of RPG systems, sure. Well, but not even not, not RPGs, but uh, like war games. That you or need war bo- games. You yeah, need both sure. manuals and like hundreds of dollars worth of manuals sure. and thousands yeah. of dollars worth of miniatures. I was thinking, yeah, that's a, that's a whole different subject because I, I I have a bunch of Warhammer Fantasy mini, minis uh, figurines actually. Uh, no, but even for the board games, the modern board games, such as the Demon's Souls one or the the ones that are made now, they're the basic, uh, you know, just just buying it outright is considerably more expensive than a video game. Difference being, you actually get physical product. Also, um, they tend to be able granted, to, you're physical, able to play the them with more pro- people. Um, also that, but the the downside is you need live people around. Yeah, uh, which you know it's it, it's kind of like a double-edged uh, sword. But the like thing if is, if you have friends, it's okay to spend like a hundred bucks on a tabletop game because you're gonna play it with your friends. If you have friends that live in the same general time zone as you do, because all of my friends <laughs> are uh, uh, are in Romania, so that's uh, the, or at least the people I play with. And that's one place where uh, the internet and multiplayer is great for us. Um, but no, I just want to say that uh, the the price for the board games also goes up, but the quality of the things that come with them also has gone insanely up. Now you you get very intricate, very nicely detailed miniatures. And talking as a as an ex miniature painter i did it for like a year or two i was really into it but i wasn't into it uh to it took a lot of time basically and you know, some some of an investment but i love miniatures and you you have to believe there's people who buy certain board games just so they have uh, just so they can collect the miniatures for instance there's the uh relatively recently released fallout board game which mm. I would, if I'd have that sort of money, I would buy just to get the miniatures because the miniatures look fucking awesome. Yeah, same with the uh, the Star Wars uh, ship game that came out a couple of years ago. It's a relatively cheap one in terms of miniature-based games, and the models are quite high quality. Oh yeah, the models for the Star Wars games are really nice. Are really nice, and they're actually they're so nice that they're basically um, what what should I call them? Um, uh, you can you can display them. They're display level quality almost, as long as you you know as you keep them in the box, mm-hmm. kind of like you would do with some Funkos or something. Oh, you, those things are dreadful. Depends. I love. Um, I like them. I have. I have two. I have. Uh, I have an Adam West Batman and a mini Judge Dredd uh, sitting on my uh, on my monitor. So I actually take them out of the box. I don't give a shit. I'm not. I'm not collecting these. I I like to use them. I like to play with them as it were. Uh, no, I kind of like those, especially the things that I like, you know, Batman, Judge that sort of stuff. But the 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 Star Wars miniatures that you're talking about, yeah, those those could be actually really can you can display them and they look super awesome to Star Wars and sci-fi geeks, obviously. Mm-hmm. Someone, some rando off the street will be like, "The fuck are these toys doing here?" The collectibles, like you display, yes. you enjoy them. I only have one of those. Uh, it's not from a board game. It's from a video game. It's the dragon. I think I showed you a couple of times from Elemental War of Magic. I, I still believe it's the only one that exists in Eastern Europe because the game was dreadful and you could not buy the collector's edition in Europe. That uh, that miniature is kind of cool. I've been trying uh, to get you to send me uh, to send it to me for a while now. But no, that that's that that's an actual cool miniature. I think I actually bent one of the horns a bit. It fell down a couple of now. Uh, that's ago. that's that's easily fixable i have some things that are in horrible shape but again i'm not gonna spend time on it because i stopped painting them a while back because yeah, uh, i keep meaning to paint for like six years yeah you've been saying that ever since you showed it to me like i don't even remember how long ago three years ago i think you showed it to mm-hmm. me the first four maybe yeah. uh so <laughs> one but, day yeah what well, maybe sure maybe when i'm retired Ah, that one. Okay, they're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna be retired with it. Yeah, <laughs> they're gonna bury me with it. Yeah, and then he's like in the grave. 
that's gonna be your uh, that's gonna be your totem. <laughs> So I'm moving away from uh, the looming embrace of death. Yeah. Uh, there's one aspect in which board games have always excelled that is not, that doesn't have anything to do with the uh, video games. It's it's a feature that I wish actually wish video games had, but they kind of can't really, for the most part, unless like developers really tie. It's the the social engineering aspect of it. Yes, that's the, that that's one of the that's that's both the main advantage or the, the 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 characteristic that sets tabletop games apart the most from video games and at the same time in obviously in certain aspects it can also be a disadvantage has way more implications social implications and general relationship uh, in implications than rage quitting uh, a video game mm. I think you dropped off there for a bit. I'm a Magic the Gathering player, by the way, so now since I use the word. So sometimes I'm in the mood to gather with people and we can spend time together and get this get this whole communal thing going. Sometimes I just want to sit at my computer in my underpants or less and play something in multiplayer. I think the internet may be playing some tricks because you cut out for a bit there. Uh, so I was saying that, um, did, did, did you hear anything about the rage quitting? Yeah, the, the very the end, yes. Okay, so the idea is that uh, rage quitting in, um, in a live, uh, in a tabletop game has way more um, repercussions, social uh, consequences than it would have if you would be rage quitting in an online game. It's or- like flipping the table. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to do it in real life. It, it's not really, not really at that that level. Hopefully, but you know, it, it, things can get heated. There's 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 situations. There's games. There's uh, personalities. Things can get heated, even though it is literally just a game. And I was saying that by the uh, sometimes I'm in the mood to gather with other people. I am a Magic the Gathering player, so. Sometimes I'm in the mood to gather with other people and get this communal thing going, but sometimes I'm just 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 interested in hanging out in front of my computer, wearing my underpants or less, and playing some multiplayer or something. Just because I'm I don't I don't want to have to deal with literally putting clothes on. Mm-hmm. So sometimes there's a the the, the social interaction aspect. Um, I see it as a as both a plus and minus. Well, it's it's something that I really enjoy, uh, like the social engineering aspect. The, the the idea that you're not really playing the game; you're playing the people you're playing the game with. You're manipulating them in accordance with the game's rules and objectives to do your bidding and basically sabotage themselves. It's a feeling that you rarely get in video games. Oh yeah, that's uh, you're absolutely right about that. You do you do actually tend to play the player. You know, you don't don't hit the uh, don't hit the player, hit the game. Uh, not in this situation. You do tend to, uh, and I think it actually at a certain level it also uh, helps with. Uh, and this is relevant more to the younger set. It actually ha- it can help to teach you. Uh, a variety of mechanisms that have to do with living and working and, uh, you know, existing in a society Uh, in terms of, as you said, not necessarily manipulating, but learning to uh, learning to interpret tone of voice, uh, body language, you know, that sort of stuff. And then you reach the, you you get into Jedi mind tricks level of things where, uh, you start using what you know about those persons uh, to your advantage and to their uh, to their fall in terms of uh, strategy in gaming. But uh, but on the other hand, there is a bunch of games that are just fun to play without that whole uh, Machiavellian uh, background yeah. to it. Without it turning into the uh, the poison scene from the Princess Bride. <laughs> yes. So I very much enjoy those games simply because that's something I don't really see in video games all that much. A couple of exceptions would be uh, Assassin's Creed multiplayer for me, 
because that's a game based entirely on deception, on tricking the enemy into thinking that you're somebody else, or it's somebody else is you. Or in um, the adaptations that are basically what are adaptations of uh, board games that you used to see quite often in uh, Warcraft 3. Did you play the uh, the werewolf mod in Warcraft 3 by any chance? No. Wasn't the what there's a werewolf mod for Warcraft 3. There's one where eight people start like in the middle of the map. They're all human. And they yeah. go off and build their farms and they can raise chickens and, you know, do all sorts of stuff. And eventually they can uh, raise armies to, you know, protect themselves. And after the first night, one player becomes a werewolf. Oh, okay. Yeah. And th- they're still a human by day, but at night they're a werewolf with the objective of killing everybody else. Makes and that's sense. sort of, that's a, adap- that's a video game adaptation of the Werewolves of Miller's Crossing or whatever that game was called. Yeah, th- we actually call that now a werewolf mechanic. Yeah, it's it's become a thing, and I've actually very recently I read um I was reading an article yesterday about like uh, some upcoming turn-based indie games because you know that's where I live, yo, uh, in the indie realm. I mean, and there is a there there is a dev I think uh, a Russian or something that are working on a on something very nice. It's called I am not a monster. Mm. It's an it's an online game. Uh, built around a very uh, 50s aesthetic, a sci-fi aesthetic. So imagine those uh, those Jetsons-like clothing and that that sort of design, that retro space look, which is which is really nice. You know, crossed with a bit of uh, Star Trek: The Original Series. And basically, is uh, the idea is you know the, it's it's a werewolf mechanic game. Uh, some people are um, aliens masquerading as uh, humans. And, you know, the humans have to find the aliens or unless the aliens uh, will eat you. So, yeah, that's a that. And I think the popularity of those games in the tabletop realm, in real life, as it were, kind of makes them a bit, um, gives them a bit of an extra step when it comes to uh, potential popularity in the video game. Because, as I was saying earlier, Sometimes I'm in the mood to meet uh, flesh bags uh, and play, but sometimes I'm just in the mood to not meet uh, with actual humans and play on the computer. But and if mm-hmm. I'm in the mood to play and if I'm in the mood to get that same experience, then I would much rather play uh, something like that. And we also had the uh, like. Um... There's one game responsible for the resurgence, I would say, of this kind of social engineering game. That was uh, Secret Hitler. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, always a fun, or always interesting to use Hitler in something that is not an internet discussion. Yeah, it just sort of came out of nowhere that game, and it's it, it's it's very nice that it revived sort of that idea of the uh, social engineering game because. Uh, up to up to the point of Secret Hitler, there was the World of Miller Crossing, the World Mechanic. There was Mafia, but at a certain point, they sort of fizzled out, like in the mid two thousands, and now they're back. And it's it's very nice to see that. Also, we had the Battlestar Galactica game. Have you had a chance to play it? No, I know, I know. It's a, uh, I do know it is a very uh, involved sort of experience to play that game. It is, especially if you, it, it even works if you don't really know the rules properly, which is what happens usually, because the game, I think, is more complicated than it needs to, needs to be. And uh, none of the expansion actually improved that. They just added more stuff on the board with more places, with more things, and it's a bit maddening to actually see the entire board with all the expansions. Yeah, well, yeah, it was it was quite the thing. It was very popular for a while, like for several years. I think the expansions is what killed it because instead of making it more playable to more people, they just added more stuff to it and made it even harder to play. Well, when it comes to tabletop games, then that's one that's one massive difference uh, between tabletop games and um, video games is that expansions can't, shouldn't, can't really um, rewrite the original. They can't really change the mechanics completely or something like that. They can only add to. Maybe they can do a bit of tweaking here and there, but uh, as opposed to 
a video game when an expansion, and as we've seen this happen with uh, World of Warcraft especially, when an expansion can really rehash it. It can change things fundamentally. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's, that's one of the one of the uh, another difference uh, and uh, something where tabletop games are let's say not as versatile as uh, video games are well you could have second editions of them like the easier the light edition if you will yeah i think those exist also but again when it comes to when it comes to board games uh, actually getting the light edition printed packaged sent sold it's a bit of a different uh, again it, it's a bit of a different uh, financial investment than yeah. uh than working on the code on the code that you've already built already you know mm -hmm. so that's that's but then again that's why usually tabletop games are incredibly well designed and super polished i mean Usually, these games spend years being tested. Mm -hmm. Different mechanics, different variations, and also they're made by designers who also, who again have a lot of years of experience doing this sort of thing, these sort of things. But uh, yeah, they have they have a totally they have a very different uh, development uh, arc, let's say it, than than video games do because. This is actually a tabletop game is actually harder to fix than uh, it was to fix a than it was to even send out a patch for a video game long before everyone had internet. Because you have to reprint manuals, you have to send corrections. It's yeah, like no, really if it's hassle. if it's a, but then again, they don't ship them with bugs, so yeah. that's uh, that that's the other that again the 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 other side of the coin. Well, though there is also one advantage that uh, tabletop games can have over video games, namely it's easy to translate a tabletop game in video game form, like just make the game in a video game form, whereas it's kind of, you have to redesign the, the a video game completely to make it a tabletop. Yeah, but you would be, you'd be surprised at the incredibly low number of uh, tabletop games that were translated perfectly translated as in uh, translated as is to the video game realm because I, I looked into it when I was doing my vid my research for my videos and I couldn't really find that many because it was a I, I believe this is this is my uh, this is my theory as a uh, quasi uh, gaming history uh, researcher let's call it uh, student, um, I think people really considered for a while considered video games to be a very, a very different category of gaming, mm -hmm. and I think they they mostly just cherry picked what they liked from a lot of tabletop mechanics, added them to their games, and then they they just made it work. There is there is less and. Uh, it, and I'm not talking about like the the basic fundamental things which come from tabletop games, you know, like uh, taking turns actually. Which, if you think about it, that's not a video game thing; it's a chess thing. Mm -hmm. Or actually, arguably, it's even older. Around this, uh, uh, around uh, the Northern European Scandinavia, there is a there is a genre of games called tuffle games, um, mm -hmm. which basic which are kind of like a proto sort of chess but the interesting thing is that they're asymmetrical hmm. yeah you don't have uh, equal number of uh, of units and they start located like basically you one player is in the middle of the map the other player has um, units on the edges of the map and the player in the middle has to manage to escape at a certain point within the map by avoiding the other player. It's a completely different sort of experience uh, than chess is. Uh, mm. But uh, 
since uh, people wanted to do video games to be this, this different this different other thing, there's very few uh, tabletop games that were actually translated. Yeah, there was a, there was a Monopoly version and there was like Cluedo, but who gives a shit about those? The by far the most uh, the the most important one that I found and was lucky enough to play was the Microprose Magic: The Gathering which was basically my introduction to the game. Um, I had no idea this was a, an actual physical card game when I when I had the Microprose game, the video game. I had no idea how to play it. I learned by... Uh, I, and I learned how to play the game by randomly doing things with the cards and the stuff. But I really enjoyed the art uh, initially. So that's what, that's what the game... That's what the game stayed on my hard drive. Yeah. And so besides those examples, um, I know there's uh, like a couple of years ago, there was a Kickstarter for a popular card game called... Until you remember, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, the Microprose Magic, the Gathering game, the Chandelar game, as we called it, because it was uh, it was based on the uh, the last expansion of it, the last uh, card pack Chandelar. That was how I got introduced to Magic Gathering as well. And I still think that that game is the best incarnation of a Magic the Gathering uh, game in video game form because it has a point to it. You actually do something in it other than just have random card battles with somebody else at the other table. Well, technically speaking, that's what the game is. You have, you're having, you're yeah, having but card battles. You, you're doing it with a, with a point, with a purpose. You're traveling around the map. You're collecting cards. You're fighting for it. Oh yeah, no, no. The the, the implementation of the of the uh, of the deck mastering, deck creation, and uh, fighting was it's fucking brilliant in Chandler. Uh yep. But again, the the actual uh, the you know the actual physical game and not and even the other online versions of it. That's just basically what you do. You pit your deck against the other player's deck. That there's and yeah. it, the, at most you're in a tournament. But just as there's more of a point with also uh, Chandler somehow had a better interface than Magic the Gathering Online. Oh yeah, the Magic the Gathering Online interface is... Uh... I bought that game in 2013, have played, have not played it in two years. I just don't want to go back to that interface. I... <laughs> yeah, no, that's... They've, they, they've had very bad... Uh... Yeah, especially uh, since, like, you know, thought it when Hearthstone came out, they already said, okay, we need to, to like, get our geese together and do something with this to improve it. Nope. Yeah, no, I don't, uh, I don't understand why the, why the video game branch of uh, Wizards is so bad at doing that stuff, but I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's I am possibly because that the, uh, the game is still saying, selling packs by the bucket load, so they don't care. Um, that's a possibility, sure. Um, financial wise, they're doing okay. Um, I, I've so I actually started playing actual magic. Uh, I can't even say how long ago. For people listening, I started playing during at the end tail of tenth edition, and I played up until like twenty twelve, and now I started again once oh. with Dominaria uh, started. So, I have a deck of white cards, a starter deck of white cards that I got in 2014, I think. Never actually played a, an actual game in real life. It's a, it's not, it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad experience. It depends a lot on the, on the people you play with, because we started again. We started playing uh, me and my friends uh, as we discovered the game, and we saw it was cool. And then we started playing, uh, and then we found out there's. Uh, there's game shops that organize and there's special events and there's special looking promo cards and there's championships and all of this shit. Uh, but I, I, I like it a lot because uh, for entertainment value and I'm a collector. So I like to collect things and I really love especially the old art. Which oh yeah, from the Alpha, the Berry set. From the, uh, basically everything in the, in the Chandelar game. Uh, so I like the cards. Also, I like I like the physical um, the physical act of holding things. And I've talked about this uh, in previous episodes when it came to throwing dice. 
By the way, yes. if anybody's interested in the art, you can find it at gathering-art.tumblr.com. You can find art from every set possible, and they do look amazing. Yeah, we're, but we're talking about uh, everything from the Alpha to Fourth Edition. Yeah, That's, this is from like from limited Alpha Edition to Kaladesh. It's got everything. Yeah, Kaladesh is uh, arguably the most recent one. Uh, Dominate, I technically is, but yeah. But no, the I, and I like that old sort of style because uh, it actually reminds me of, and I only realized this when I started playing Heroes 2 again. It looks a lot kind of like the, the the color choices and the uh, the overall atmosphere of uh, mid '90s Magic cards really looks a lot like Heroes of Mighty Magic 2. Not in not not in the uh, not in the uh, aesthetic details, but in the in the spirit, in the overall art direction, in the feel of it. That's that that's what uh, they they say to me, and that's why. Heroes of Might Magic 2, anyway, is one of my favorite games ever. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, I was talking about uh, the fact that very few games, um, very few tabletop games. Uh, so I was talking about that very few games, tabletop games, got translated to a uh, video game. I know uh, the, that Kickstarter was for the card game called Gloom. Mm, sounds very gloomy. Oh, it's it's really nice. It's, the the point of Gloom is to kill your characters. Oh, so it's like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, what do you want to call it? Dungeon Crawl Classics. No, 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 not like that. No, it's uh, no, it's not like that. No, basically, you have like a deck of cards of a family. Imagine the Adams family, like goth, dark shit, but not comedic. And the idea is, you get uh, you get a bunch of other cards, and the more depressed your characters are by you putting debuffs on them, the better it is for you. So the, the quicker they die. Uh, the 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 quicker you win the game, and if you make the families of your enemies happy, that's a bad thing. So it's sort of like that uh, remade version of that poem we have. That outside is gloomy and cold, and in in the furnace, mom's burning. It's that's, kind of, yeah. Nah, it's, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a very good uh, it's a it's a pretty <laughs> decent weird analogy that only Romanian speakers will get. So yeah, there's gloom, and very super duper recently, because I just I just got the uh, a beta review key now is Post Human Sanctuary, which mm. is a board game, a uh, post apocalyptic board game that takes place in Europe. That they finally finally got around to uh, getting a, an early access build up on Steam. I've actually been uh, I, I I worked with these guys for a while uh a couple of years ago when they were uh, when they were preparing this when actually during during their after their failed kickstarter because the that that kickstarter really caught my attention and i'm really glad to see that uh, we're not we, we stopped collaborating like two and a half years ago so anyway uh i we stopped collaborating like two and a half years ago um, but I'm really glad they got the they, they got the game finally up on early access, and I will check it out at a certain point uh, and make a video. Obviously, um, do you know other uh, tabletop games that got translated perfectly? As in, they just got translated uh, bit by bit. I know uh, one of them in particular is Talisman. Which is a Warhammer-ish. It's a Games Workshop game. I think it's set in the Warhammer universe. One of them. It was initially made as a only a single-player game, and then it was dreadful mm. because the point of the game is not you losing because you rolled something and you have no choice of what you actually do. But it's more of a thing of oh look, the person I'm playing with failed so hard, I'm now laughing so much that I just crap myself. That's the point of the game. And okay. they added multiplayer to it, so it is a much more fun experience now. And there's also the uh, the thing, well, you've said to me a couple of times that it's the age of uh, tabletop games, because they're everywhere right now. Yes, they are. And I think we may be seeing uh, a rise of tabletop games like directly made as video games. 
One example is Gremlin Zinc that came out on Steam, I think, a year or two ago. And it's been, like, very successful. And it's, it's, it's an absolute tabletop game, but it's built purposefully as a video game. And I think that may be a new thing that's gonna rise. I hope it is, because you can make a lot of interesting games when uh, the computer handles all the rules. True, true. But again, you'd be you, you'd be taking out the whole um, social engineering, as you call it, and I just call it like social interacting and relationship. Not um, necessarily. Like, you can still you can still have the game have that as an aspect. Just uh, you know, let it be built yeah. within the game. Oh yeah, like, yeah, sure. I gave you the example of the werewolf game. That was also based on social engineering because while, when you were the werewolf, it was your in your best interest to make the other players think that somebody else was the werewolf. Yeah, but no, uh, so I, I understand that social engineering from a gaming mechanics point of view. I'm looking at it from the actual interrelationship building, like human to human social uh, social aspect of it, like literally interacting with someone. Like having someone in real life with In you. real life, yeah, that's... That's that's the approach I take to it. Cause yeah, nowadays, fuck it. Nowadays we can play, we can play D and D. We can play whatever the fuck we want out over the internet. Cause we have Skype, we have Discord now, which is better than fuck Skype. We have Discord. Uh, there's there's special online platforms that allow you to play D and D. There's even there's even a specially designed made one from D and D ever since fourth edition, I think. Uh, they had like uh, a, a means of getting online and using the uh, using the internet to play as well. So we have cameras, we have all of these things. We can definitely do it. But my point is that it's not exactly the same sort of experience as it is when you're literally uh, sitting next to that person. It's close. In terms, in terms of the gameplay, it's pretty much the same. But when it comes to all of those other things the, that I'm that that I'm trying to talk about, or that I'm I'm not sure I'm making clear uh, of you know like developing social skills per se in real life, it, 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 there's a difference between social skills online and social skills in real life. There's a difference because there's a person right there with you with all the tics, like the facial cues, the the mannerism of a person that knows they're not alone in a room. Because yeah. even if you're seeing a, another person on camera, you know that they're not there with you. And they can always shut down the camera. You know, you can't you can't really shut down being next to a person. You, sure, yeah. you can leave, but even leaving is, uh, it, is a social message. So While here's... Here's the thing, um, Ubisoft announced a year or two ago that they're making a uh, werewolf-style game, but in VR. Yeah. Do you think VR has a chance of actually improving that connection? I don't think so, because not unless we're talking about uh, something that would basically uh, literally scan your uh, body in real life. You know, so that they, so that people can see those things, you know, those, and can pick up on those details. And again, that's not, I don't think computing technology is there yet. Possibly, it's nowhere near possible to do that. We're still at sort of quest world level of technology right now, like in terms it, of how the characters look. Yeah, it's not even, yeah, <laughs> quest world, nice reference there, man. That's old school shit. Yeah. Um, so I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a VR human. I'm not a. I'm. I'm not interested in VR games at all. At I don't even watch movies in 3D because I don't care for movies in 3D. If a, the movie is good, it should be good in 2D on my small screen at home. Uh, basically, otherwise, yeah, sure. There's a difference between that and entertaining movies. You go. You go to some movies or you watch some movies just to have fun, which is totally fine. But I'm talking about like good movies here things that are meant to uh to have staying power it don't lean casablanca in 3d do you fucking hope not although now that you mention it someone's gonna do it citizen kane 3d well actually first of all citizen kane is really boring it's a greatly 
it's greatly shot <laughs> movie. Know. It's pioneering. It's fucking boring, man. Uh, I forgot what we're talking about. In Citizen Kane, that you could actually uh, reshoot or create in 3D, but that would take away from the fact that they obtained those shots with ancient technology and with mirrors and camera tricks and lighting and that sort of stuff and that sort of stuff. Um, but where, so, yeah, where was I? I, I forgot. Like we start talking about movies. Well, I think well, it was yeah. The, I was uh, in D and D uh, and yeah, you were talking yeah, about VR. social engineering. Yeah, yeah, you were talking about social engineering as a game mechanic, and I'm talking about social engineering as in, in the sense of literal social interaction and developing yeah. social skills in real life. Yeah, and we are not really being up to snuff at helping. Yeah, with no, that yet. no, 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 not not anytime soon. Not anytime. Maybe within our lifetimes, but maybe towards the end. But I think we'll have bigger fish to fry by then. Literally, like we're probably going to have gigantic mutant fish roaming the earth. Yes, and they'll be frying because the temperatures will be so high. Yeah. They already are. Oh my God, I'm dying here. Yeah. So what uh, tabletop games are you playing in, have you played in recent times? I mean, uh, apart from Magic the Ring. Apart from Magic, I played a bunch of, a, a bunch of the, the more well-known ones. And I noticed that there's a reason why they're well-known because they're really cool. So I played the Dead of Winter. Oh, we played that too on uh, Tabletop Simulator as well. Yeah. We did not really understand the rules super well, but we got uh, we got a lot of mileage out of it. It's uh, it's basically the tabletop version of you know Walking Dead, you could call it, but with less dialogue and less you know soap opera shit. Um, uh, unless somebody draws a card that makes them do something that's against the party's intentions. Yeah, that's a that's that's part of the game mechanic so i played that that was pretty cool um i played the uh, small world which is also it, it, it's very nice it's very fun it's kind of like um it's an rpg ish slash civ sort of game in the sense that you have civilizations that have bonuses uh, they they have uh, uh, various characteristics and yeah, you have to occupy terrain, and there's a bunch of things. So that was fun as well. And one of the coolest uh, games I've played is Pandemic. Pandemic we, is an awesome tabletop game. We wanted to play that, but had no idea how. Uh, the manual isn't that thick, but there's a lot of there's there's a lot of stuff to read into it. Uh, but it's really, it's really nice. I mean, it's a, it's a co-op game and it's, it's one, it's a very good co-op game. It reminds me a bit of the, the movie Contagion, which is also, uh, about, a, a, a some sort of a pandemic, but, uh, in the game pandemic, you can actually, you have to deal, you can deal with several diseases at the same time. And yeah, it's it's very nice. It's very strategic. It, there's there's tactics involved. Each player will have their own skills that they can uh, add to the game. So yeah, I really uh, I really enjoy Pandemic. Although I have to I have to say, uh, most of these games are quite the time investment. Oh, absolutely. Uh, some of them are like thirty to forty five minutes. Uh, Plus some setup of them, time. Yeah, some of them can go way past the hour, depending on your level of proficiency and the, high, the difficulty level of the game. But um, two tabletop uh, titles that I suggest that I would suggest to start with would be uh, Desert Island or uh, what's the other one? Not Desert Island. Lonely. Is it Lonely? Damn it. Let me... Ah, God damn it. I forgot the title. Let me let me do a bit of research uh, into that one. And you can say if you've played anything else. Well, uh, we've played games mostly through Tabletop Simulator because we cheap bastards and live in different parts of the country. Oh, yeah. We do have to... We, we should mention that Tabletop Simulator is a, is a, is a great 
uh, is a great piece of software. Yeah, we um, one of the games that I really enjoyed in recent years was I, I think it was Spycraft or something like that. The yeah. idea is that everybody draws a card. Uh, one of them is the card for a spy. Everybody apart from the spy knows what location uh, everybody else is, and the spy has to figure out um, the location. And they do it by everybody has to ask questions that are vague enough so that the people who know where they are will know what it's about, but the spy won't. But the objective of it, well, either the spy finding out where he is, or everybody else finding out who the spy is. Okay, that yeah, sounds cool. Sounds cool. Sounds again. It's very. Um, I, I, these types of games always make me think of like a Cold War uh, sort of spy movie, or like you know, like like a spy thriller. Like, ooh, who did that? Where, who, where, where are they religious? That sort of stuff. Yes, yeah, something like that. And um, Twitter games, I really like. Uh, I really enjoyed. One of them was, uh, I was sort of mentioned uh, Dead of Night, but you said it already. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dead of Winter, pardon, Dead of Winter. Um, one of them is Betrayal on that house at Haunted Hill. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a Betrayal. And, uh, I played that as well, and actually we played it online. Um, I, but I played it in real life as well, which is also cool. First of all, no, it's, it's a game where you basically draw cards to figure out what kind of Scooby-Doo episode you're in. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. You're basically playing as the Scooby-Doo gang. Only in, instead of there being fake monsters, there's actually real monsters, and your characters have a good chance of dying. Yes, because at a certain point, one of them, totally random, will become the villain, as it were. Or, you know, the the tool of the villain. But yeah. Uh, okay, so I got the the, the games I would suggest uh, are Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert. Hmm. They're very nice. They're very cool games. Uh, you don't need a lot of... Uh, they're, they're easy to learn and they're really... They, they keep you on your toes. There's, there's some tactics, but there's a ticking clock as well. It's uh, they're, they're really nice games to play. And i like to also mention, uh, again, it's... It's probably one of the better card games in terms of non-collectible stuff that I've played. It's Red Dragon Inn. It's oh, a game yeah, where everybody, game. everybody draws cards with the objective of either drinking the other person under the table or punching them until they go under the table. Nobody dies, nobody gets permanently injured, but it's, it's just a load of fun. It's, it's about a bunch of adventures at the tavern getting drunk. It's superb. Yeah, it's, the, it's, uh, it's basically what happens uh, in some D and D sessions that go off the rails. Yeah, it's basically but, that for like two hours. Not that not that session should be on rails per se. Just in the sense that sometimes uh, players will be in the mood just to start some shit. And and they get drunk. Yeah, or they don't, and they just start some shit. But they usually get drunk because you know it's fun. To get drunk, especially in game, and especially if you have some some like a really uh, tank like build, if you're like a fighter or a barbarian, it's just there's it just doesn't matter if you're drunk because does no one can usually hurt you. One of the things I liked about Red Dragon is that they actually use the tabletop implementation, which at first you think, oh, it's somebody just remade the game there without the permission of the creators. They're actually using that to playtest the final version of cards, of characters. That's always a great idea. It is. And of course, Tabletop uh, Tabletop Simulator does have a bunch of uh, actual for sale uh, implementations of certain video games, like uh, I think Super Fight was one of them. You can, get, you can actually buy Super Fight for Tabletop Simulator with all the cards it has. And Super Fight is a card where you draw cards to... Um, basically collect superpowers to be either a villain or a hero and you have to use your imagination to best explain how your power defeats the villain's power that's nice i love those i love i love the games that have this uh narrative storytelling component to them this is something that i'm trying to that i want actually to implement in the rpg system that i've been quote unquote working on for the past many years um, yeah, and that's another thing that I noticed is that uh, a bunch of you know like like the lower uh, the, the the super indie 
lower experience, lower budgeted uh, tabletop games uh, that do make it on uh, crowdfunding tend to also have a tabletop simulator version in one of the uh, one of the tiers. Um, this happened relatively recently when I, I actually reviewed one of the tabletop games I reviewed uh, is from uh, is a card game. Uh, somewhat inspired by Magic the Gathering, but it's from an indie dev in Sweden. It's called State of Wonder, and they have a they have a tabletop simulator version as well. Um, and there's a bunch of others. There's there's uh, there, there's one with um, a Max, which you might like. It's called Aegis something, uh, which in which you basically build, uh, you cobble together a, your own Max. Yeah, there's one game like that in uh, the default version of Tabletop Simulator as well. I just forgot what the name was. And I, you dropped again. No, no, it's cool. It's cool. I was oh. just I was just breathing deeply. Uh, and another, uh, actually, uh, a game I have which is very fun. It's called uh, Unspeakable Words, and it's basically a uh, it's a cross between. It's basically Scrabble with cards. Mm-hmm. The, the The idea being, uh, you each have five points of sanity, and you get like seven uh, seven cards, seven letters, and you have to make a word out of these. Uh, each letter has a point attached to it. The points, uh, the the number of points, is directly. Uh, linked to the number of angles the letter has. (laughs) So O will have zero points, for instance. And once you uh, play the, the, the word, you add up the number and then you have to roll a D20. And if you save, so if you roll, uh, uh, actually, I think, yeah, if you roll uh, up until or equal to, no, uh, equal to or over, I think. Yeah, if you if you roll equal to or over, you're safe. But if you roll under, you lose one point of sanity. Mm. By the way, the sanity tokens are all tiny Cthulhu's. because that's because that's why the unspeakable was the f- the super duper fun. Uh, there, there's a bunch of extra uh, there's a bunch of extra rules that you can add to the game. Uh, but the really cool thing is that once you're at one sanity. So you're basically one point away from dying. The words you pr- you're basically a mad person. So mad people don't have to actually use real words. They can just make up gibberish. Exactly. So you can actually just use any card you want uh, and create words. But the cool thing is that you can add this rule in and that the the player has to explain what the word means. So, so like they crown him when when there's nothing they can do anymore at the hospital they crown him yes or the crowning is the 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 the, the, the process through which um they liquefy the brain and they get to then uh, slurp it out with uh, straws <laughs> that that's that, and that's really really cool again it's it's just uh, the thing that i really like uh, this making up a lot of making up random shit so yeah, unspeakable Seinfeld fans that got that. Unspeakable, uh, unspeakable words is uh, it, it, uh, it, it's it's pretty cool game. Also, Munchkin. You can you can try with Munchkin. Munchkin is a, a boiled down version of what a D and D close to what a D and D encounter might be. Mm-hmm. Difference being that uh, the characters can help each other or hinder each other. So there's Ooh. that thing. Cool. But yeah, but there's items, there's stuff like that, and there is there's a bunch of monsters. Yeah, no, it's uh, Munchkin is also a nice one to start with. Since we've already gone past one hour, I think we should probably end this before my internet just dies altogether. So, okay, are there I... any closing ideas you would have about uh, tabletops, about their future, about their potential? Well, um, what I see as a, a future for tabletop games is. Um, them mixing and implementing augmented reality, mm-hmm. which is a thing that some people have been starting to prototype with. So, you know, you can always have minis, but those are relatively expensive to make. But if you could make just the just the square and then 
looking at it with your phone, you'll actually get to see your character, and maybe even you get to see it animated, maybe get to see it fight other stuff. I mean, imagination is great, but it's also nice to see it on the screen. See what I mean? That could actually also work for implementing like um, additional features or hidden roles within cards to make uh, oh, yeah. rolling easier. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But again, so that, that's that, that's like on a technological level, on a development from that point of view, that's where I would see them going, uh, blending some augmented reality into them. Otherwise, uh, I don't really think because they're so... Uh, they, uh, like I said, they developed and evolved so quickly. Now there is all manner of things you can play, you can buy, you can get all types of experiences from the random and co uh, and cooperative to the very well planned out tactical, strategic, hour long games that are anything but cooperative. So there's a lot of choice now, and a lot of those games are really, really cool. Absolutely. And some of them may take a while for you to actually understand how you properly play them, but they're worth it. They usually are, yeah. They're worth it both for the gaming experience and for uh, what uh, Unicom calls social engineering and what I uh, refer to as uh, social interaction training that you get uh, when you play with real-life humans. Mm. So well, I, I guess, think we should. Uh, I think we should uh, cap this one. Okay. So, do you have anything coming up on your channel soon? Because you sent me a file with plans that you have for the future. Yeah. Technically, uh, technically, I should. I've been having some insane problems with my desktop ever since uh, ever since last Friday. I just it, it's freezing up on me. I'm getting blue screens of death upon blue screens of death with different errors each time. I'm. I'm still troubleshooting, although I don't know how much, how many more things I can troubleshoot about. Have you tried resetting uh, the BIOS? I've updated the BIOS, actually. Oh. So oh. I imagine it uh, pretty much did uh, did anything that it could do. Uh, so all this I, of this to pull out components one by one, see which one of them it is. I don't know. I hope it's, I don't know. I don't know. So technically... If I get if I get like some windows of computer uh, of the computer functioning, I will have a video about the book of demons out at some point during the week. But I don't know. I need to. Uh, you know, right now I'm I'm recording off of my backup laptop. So yeah, we're gonna have to. I'm gonna. I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully yes. Most likely not. Hopefully you'll get it fixed. Maybe it's something yeah. minor, like, I don't know, uh, a bit flipped on the SSD, and now it's wonky, but it'll be fine later. Who knows? I don't know, man. Can only hope. As for uh, Gaming HD, you're going to start seeing uh, the normal uh, shows back again with uh, the Gaming Codex and all the other stuff, because I'm my, my uh, mini vacation in which I was supposed to rest up because of all that coughing that has 99% gone away is, is done now. So look out for more content and the the uh, the new show as well which is going to have a, a bit of a twist this week Ooh. it sort of just came to mind um you weren't a big fan of angel and buffy were you no no i was i was kind of i was a bit over the age target when uh, those things uh were on those things are like some episodes are absolutely timeless but the uh, there's an episode of angel where felt it's involved that's going to be a bit similar to what I'm going to do with the new show next time I'm I'm sure uh, fans uh, watchers will know what the fuck you're talking about or also if you if you watch community it's um, something happens like sitcoms do this some sitcoms do this or shows do this quite often something happens to the characters it's just unexplainable but everybody rolls with it because it's fun sure sure cool cool and, well, I guess that'll be about it. Thanks to everyone for sticking with us, even though the internet has uh, decided to screw us over again. Damn you, yeah. RDS. Yeah, one, one, one day was the mic, now it's the internet. My well, computer's on the fritz. Actually, the internet was twice, because it also didn't work like uh, with, when we talked about the NES. You had to record that, that uh, locally. At your, oh, yeah, yeah, because it was... I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't know. Internet's screwing us again. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully uh, this won't be too much of a pain to wait together. Although it might be a bit of an annoyance, but now oh, well, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, okay. Goodbye, everybody. See you next time.